All right, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all so much for being here. Um, I'm Rep. Erica Eiderhoven, and I'm just so deeply grateful and humbled for everyone here today. We are in standing room only, and we also have an additional 40 people joining us over Zoom. So really, it means the world to so many of us that you're all here uh, to commemorate this, this wonderful day. And I just want to, before we dive in, acknowledge all of the elected officials and legislators in the room. Uh, thank you, uh, Michelle Wu, Mayor of Boston, for, for joining us. Uh, we have Representative Taki Chan. Uh, yeah. <laughs> We also have Rep. Uh, Steve Voltrino from Malden. Yeah, thank you. So we have uh, Rep. Vana Howard coming from Lowell. Rep. Paul Donato, <laughs> from Medford. Yep. Uh, we have Senator Jamie Eldridge. We have Representative Steve Owens. Yeah, thank you. And I also just want to extend a special thank you to Senator Eldridge. As always, it's a joy to work with you, but thank you for your office for coordinating the, the logistics and, and securing the space. Um, we are here today for a historic celebration and community reckoning, and it just really uh, thank you all so much for being here. Um, just give a, provide a little context. During World War II, over 120,000 individuals of Japanese descent were incarcerated by the U.S. government without due process, strictly based on their race and ethnicity. Two-thirds of those incarcerated were U.S. citizens, including 17,000 of whom were children under the age of 10 years old. Uh, Fred Korematsu, for those who don't uh, are familiar, he is someone who refused to accept this blatant violation of his rights, and he resisted his incarceration and was subsequently arrested on the charge of suspicion of being Japanese. Fred challenged his imprisonment in court and the Supreme <coughs> Court sadly ruled against him. Effectively, in that Supreme Court ruling, they ruled that incarcerating American citizens en masse based on their race and ethnicity without any individual due process is constitutional. This case is often cited as one of the worst Supreme Court decisions in US history, and this ruling is still with us today. Our history is still with us in the present moment, whether it be Guantanamo Bay detainees, Donald Trump's Muslim ban, or the state governments of Texas, Arizona, Florida, who are mass busing migrants out of their respective states. So Fred Korematsu, who we're here to celebrate today, was a civil rights activist who, alongside other Japanese Americans, including Min Yasui, Gordon Hirabayashi, and Mitsue Endo, stood up against all odds for justice for all. And we're here today because their stories are not only Asian American Pacific Islanders history, but it is quintessentially American history. This is why I'm so deeply honored and humbled and proud to announce that today, Massachusetts has become the 13th state in the nation to recognize Fred T. Korematsu Day. And as a part of this commemoration, could all the members of the House uh, Asian Caucus join me so that we may present the state's proclamation to Dr. Karen Korematsu, the daughter of Fred Korematsu and founder and president of the Fred T. Korematsu Institute, uh, this proclamation. We're we reading this. It's very long. Yeah, it's very we're not going to do this to people, are we? No, we're not. I, I think we, we're presenting. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's, it's beautiful and long, but it's uh, got a lot of statements in it. <laughs> well, thank you. Okay. All right. All right. I think so. When, when yes. arm bandit here. Yes. I'll be your right arm. Thank 
you. So I also want to express um, this. This is just so um, humbling to have our greater API community here. And I just want to acknowledge, if we go to the next slide, um, express appreciation to the over 30 uh, local community organizations partnering with us to make this event possible. And I also wanted to send a special thank you to all of the Japanese and API vendors that were supporting this event. Um, yes. <laughs> So yes, please grab some um, delicious coffee and, and Japanese pastries uh, before you head out. Um, and now we're going to hear directly from a local survivor of Japanese incarceration, Margie Yamamoto, uh, who is also the co-president of the Japanese American Citizens League New England chapter. So we're going to play, yeah. Good afternoon. I'm Margie Yamamoto, and I'm going to share with you the story of my family's incarceration during World War II. In order to do that, I'd like to show you a few pictures from that era. My family's story is just one of the thousands to result from the Japanese American incarceration during World War II. My mother was born in Hilo, Hawaii in 1904. She was an American citizen. My father was born in Japan in 1900. And he came to America around 1926, during the time of the Asian Exclusion Act that barred all Asian immigrants. He entered the States through Mexico by joining a group of migrant farm workers. And yes, he was an early illegal alien. They were mar married in 1931 in Los Angeles and settled in Los Angeles in an area called Terminal Island. Terminal Island is an actual island located in the port of Los Angeles. To the north is Los Angeles, and it's located between San Pedro and Long Beach. The 3,000 residents of the island were mostly Japanese and Japanese American. The men were fishermen, and the women worked in the canneries processing the fish they caught. When the war broke out, because of Terminal Island's location and the men's access to boats, it became the first area closed down by the military. That gave all the residents 48 hours to leave their homes and businesses and evacuate the island. It was especially difficult for our family since we owned a grocery store, had three children under the age of eight, and my mother was two weeks from giving birth to her fourth child, me. With the assistance of family and friends, my parents were able to meet the deadline. The military provided no help. About one month later, the military began the mass expulsion of Japanese and Japanese Americans from the West Coast. We were eventually sent to the concentration camp in Gila River, Arizona. There were 13,348 people living in our camp, making it the fourth largest city in the state of Arizona. With so many people, there was no privacy anywhere, from the showers to the toilets. We were housed in military-style barracks that were divided into living units for families. Our family of six lived in a space 20 by 25 feet in size. This photo was taken on April 21st, 1944, the day we left Gila River, after two years, eight and a half months of incarceration. Our personal cameras had been confiscated when the war broke out, so this is the only picture I have of me as an infant. We were allowed to leave the camp before the war ended as long as we did not return to the West Coast, so we lived in Denver and then Chicago. There are so many stories to come out of the camps. There is one story told to me by my brother, that I will always remember because it reflects the lasting effect of our experience. My brother Ted was about six or seven when we were living in Denver. The war was still going on and he was running around the house playing soldier and using every expletive in his limited vocabulary to describe the evil Japanese enemy. My mother told him to stop saying those things because he was Japanese. He refused to believe her. 
and he ran and got the newspaper and showed her the comics with drawings of the enemy with buck teeth, glasses, and slitty eyes. I don't look like that, he insisted. Somehow my mother did convince him he was Japanese. Dad told me, Ted told me, he remembered staring in a mirror and crying. He said it took him a week to get over it. Our family emerged from incarceration relatively healthy and intact. There were many others who were not as fortunate. What happened to us is more than 80 years in the past. But thanks to the work of men like Fred Korematsu, we will not forget the fragile nature of the constitutional rights guaranteed all of us as American citizens. And what happened to us could still happen again to anyone because of their race, religion, ethnic origin, or political belief. Thank you. Thank you. It's, um, it's really moving for me to hear Margie speak. And we'll hear also from uh, Karen, Dr. Karen Korematsu and other family members of survivors shortly. Um, but I just wanted to say a few words about why I filed H3119, an act designating January 30th as Fred Korematsu Day of Civil Liberties and the Constitution. Um, I grew up outside of Boston. My mom immigrated from Japan when she was a teenager, and her first job here was being a housemaid for a family in Brookline. And like many Asian American kids, daughter of immigrants, I didn't see myself in our history books or stories. I was treated like a perpetual foreigner and felt like a foreigner even though I was born in Boston. I didn't have a sense of where I belonged, and I absorbed deeply harmful narratives around being a bottom minority and having to be perfect but not raise my voice. I was pigeonholed as a math student and more, more tragically I believed those repeated messages and didn't believe I was capable of my other talents. I never felt my culture was affirmed or appreciated at school even though I spoke Japanese at home and most profoundly I felt invisible and it wasn't until much later in my adulthood that I found my voice and learned how to use it to fight for what I believe in. And so, Karen, it means so much to me to be able to welcome you to Massachusetts uh, because I learned about Fred's story through your story, and it's always been so resonant to me. Um, so Karen uh, actually learned about her father's landmark, to be clear, landmark Supreme Court case that is taught in every law school uh, across the country, not from her father, but from a classmate who happened to do a book report on Fred Korematsu, and I remember distinctly in one of your interviews that everyone in the class kind of turned to her when they said Fred Korematsu and was like, isn't that your father? Um, and uh, I just, it makes me reflect on how painful this experience must have been for Fred um, and how his fight was a lonely fight. Um, not only did his country turn its back on him, his Japanese family, the Japanese community, out of a desire not to rock the boat, to shake things up, the desire to keep to themselves, they didn't support his legal case. And it's something that I think a lot of us sort of feel from our upbringing. It's really resonant. It's certainly very resonant uh, to me because they were afraid. Um, and so this is really the injustice of invisibility that I feel so core uh, to myself, and it genuinely guides my work in the legislature. Um, and that's why I filed this bill, uh, to bring visibility and education on Fred's story and his fight and activism. I'm just so grateful of Dr. Karen Korematsu for fighting and for, you know, founding this institute to keep his story uh, alive. And I just want to thank uh, all the co-sponsors of this legislation, uh, Rep. Taki Chan, Rep. Steve Ultrino, who I might be still here. Oh, there, yeah, Steve Ultrino, uh, Senator Jason Lewis, Senator Lydia Edwards, Rep. Vana Howard, uh, Rep. Samantha Montano and, and Rep. Carmen Gentile. And of course, I uh, really want to invite all of my other colleagues to please uh, co-sponsor and support this legislation. So thank you all so much. Um, I am so honored to introduce dear, uh, our dear mayor of Boston, Michelle Wu. Thank you so much for, for being here with us. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, oh, can you hear me? Is this better? Okay. 
Um, first of all, thank you so much to Representative Erica Eiderhoven for not only your principled, courageous leadership always, but for making sure that we could celebrate this day today together. Um, so another round of applause for Erica. Thank you for always showing up for us. Um, and thank you to all of the legislators who are hosting us here today. We're so grateful for your leadership and for all that you do across the Commonwealth. Um, I will echo the thanks to every rep and senator who's in the room and especially give a shout out to the AAPI caucus members. Thank you so much, Rep Chan, for paving the way for all of us in the State House. Thank you for what you do. Um, it's been so fun to get to know you as a mom and uh, as, as a fellow elected official in office. And, um, thank you. There are so many folks in this room who represent uh, all the many ceilings that have had to be, be shattered, uh, even in very recent years, but also the scars and the bruises that come from being the one to bust through. Um, and so as I think especially as we're thinking about the legacy of so many trailblazers who put themselves in harm's way so that we could have a better shot at a future, um, that was a sacrifice and a burden that we celebrate now, often just in terms of the courage that it took, the morals that it took, the foresight and the leadership, but there is also a deep trauma and pain and um, for family members now generations after to still stand up and share that story and help continue the message um, means so much. And so thank you, Dr. Korematsu, uh, for what you continue to do. And thank you to all of those who are descendants of and um, continue to share the history that we very much need to be reminded of. Um, this bill, uh, House Bill 3119, um, will be celebrated now January 30th of each year, thanks to the folks who are in this room. And um, I wanna give a shout out also to um, some other folks in the community who help support this initiative and others to, to really lift up the visibility and leadership of uh, our community. In addition to the API caucus members, I wanna thank the Asian Community Fund at the Boston Foundation for all the work they do across so many sectors and supporting the infrastructure. Um, the Coalition for Anti-Racism, Equity and Justice in Education, also known as CARE, the State Massachusetts AAPI Commission, um, we'll have our commissioners give a wave so we can thank you. Some folks, I see Danielle, just don't be afraid to raise your hand. <laughs> we have at least one here. Thank you for all your leadership. Um, the UMass Boston Institute for Asian American Studies, you will hear from a fearless leader very soon. And I also wanna shout out our city of Boston API um, employee resource group for all that they do at the local level um, in partnership as well. Um, in a little bit of a similar way to um, Dr. Korematsu, I also first learned about Fred Korematsu when I was in a classroom, although certainly it was a much less jarring experience to not, you know, not learning about my father's history unfold before me, but about a history that I had never heard before either. I was in law school and had gone through all of elementary school, all of middle school, all of high school, and college uh, without having been taught about a man whose story connected with so much of what I could still relate to growing up in, at the time that I did. His story and his fearlessness and willingness to sacrifice uh, and, and take on this battle has instilled in so many, including myself, a broader and more expansive understanding of our community and also of the powers um, that the law represents, but also the gaps that still exist, no matter what the language on pieces of paper can say compared to what is carried out in real life. So I wanna thank Dr. Korematsu for more than a decade and a half of leadership at the Fred Korematsu Institute, working to ensure that our young people today grow up knowing this history and seeing themselves uh, represented and carrying on justice. Fred Korematsu's story is so important, not because he did something no one else could, but because he chose to do something that all of us can. He spoke up in the face of unfairness. He refused to accept the inequitable incarceration of his community, of his people, of Asian Americans in America treated like foreigners. 
and the experience that so many within our community and beyond know of what it means to be in this complex country of America. He reminds us that our democracy's pillars are the people who protect it, that it couldn't exist and certainly couldn't be sustained on its own, and that democracy depends on people like us making choices like Fred did to stand up and speak out when our system falls short. It's a lesson that we know well here in Boston and that our history has been built on. We're the home of the revolution that birthed this country, the abolitionist <coughs> movement that allowed it to continue to survive. But we continue to look back at our history and find ways that we have fought to exclude and deny in busing, in redlining, and even in internment at 287 Marginal Street in East Boston, where Japanese, German, and Italian families were detained as well. It is a painful history to recall, but bringing it into the light is essential to ensure that we don't relive it. And at the city, we are also trying to take every possible step to openly and honestly examine our history in order to begin healing. Last week, we announced two teams of researchers who will be working with our reparations task force to chronicle Boston's full role in the transatlantic slave trade and the institution of slavery. At a time when education around the country is under attack, when some of the loudest voices are actively advocating that we erase and forget or even mischaracterize, Boston is choosing instead to learn from the example of Fred, of Karen, and of people in this room, to stand up and speak out and invest in each other to take seriously the promise of our democracy at its best, and to take seriously our role in keeping it intact. There's a lot that we are all going to be called on this next year to continue all of those pieces. And I'm so grateful again to Rep. Eiderhoven and all of the legislators and the governor and the state for making sure that now enshrined in our laws is an annual reminder and a legacy that we will continue to pass on. Uh, so before I turn it over to um, Dr. Korematsu, I just want to also contribute to her growing certificate pile uh, with our very own City of Boston one as well. Okay. Let me do the formal introduction oh, to a pioneer and trailblazer and someone we are so honored to have here with us today, Dr. Karen Kormatsu. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, greetings Boston and the Commonwealth and happy Fred Kormatsu Day of Civil Liberties in the Constitution. <laughs> the size of this audience and standing room only, and, and all the people that it has taken to put this day together, the proclamations, um, you know, thank you, uh, Representative Erica and, and Mayor Michelle, uh, for your, for your uh, proclamations. Uh, it means so much to me. I mean, they're, they're very, very special. <clears throat> thank you. Um, it's uh, also incredible to learn that how large of an Asian American community you do have for the state of Massachusetts, and that representation matters. The, the, the point of my Father's Day, yes, is you know, to honor him, which I'm certainly you know, touched, but also it's a day about our civil liberties and the Constitution, which is what his day really represents. And it takes all of us as a reminder to keep fighting for our democracy that representation matters, and that to make a difference, you have to participate. That's why voting is so important. Um, the, through the Korematsu Institute, we are, are uh, emphasizing and focusing on civic participation, which obviously all of you are demonstrating by being here today, so I'm very proud of you. Give yourselves a round of applause. 
because that's what it's going to take to, 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 to make a difference. And also it's a day um, to remind people of how important advocacy is. Uh, it's, it, it takes um, you know, each of us to participate and to share our stories as well. It's important, you know, when I talk to students, to share their story and, and to learn where they have come from, what, their, what the struggles have been for their families. Because, you know, our, our, our names and our faces may change, but the struggle to uh, come to this country as immigrants, unless you're indigenous, is really the same. It takes a lot of, of uh, courage and work to, to be here where we are now. And, but we can't stop. You know, obviously there is so much more to do. Um, you know, the Korematsu Institute is emphasizing um, our education and civic participation. We're a national organization that works with educators in each state. I work with the National Council for Social Studies and the Council of State Social Studies Supervisors. So I've been working, I'm working with this state as well to help with curriculum for AAPI um, history uh, and, and current events to be taught in the schools because that's how we're going to make that change. You know, ignorance is prejudice and it's because if you don't know about someone's story, if you don't know about where they've come from, then you can be afraid of them. And, you know, my, my father um, you know, took this on in 1942 in the face of adversity. His family was not behind him. His own Japanese American community was not behind him. They didn't want anything to do with him because, as uh, Representative Erica said, that you know they thought some might, harm might come to them. But the one thing that uh, that I learned, even though I learned about my father's case in high school, um, and actually uh, my friend uh, didn't say my father's first name. All she said was Korematsu. And I thought, oh, that has to be some black sheep of the family. <laughs> <laughs> my father had three brothers, and certainly it was one of them. Um, and so after class, I said to my friend Maya, well, what's this about? She says, this is about your dad. I said, no way. <laughs> Somebody would have told me. And of course, I go home and confront my mother, and I got the standard answer. <clears throat> you'll have to wait until your father gets home to ask him. <laughs> For you parents, you get that one. Um, and and he not, you know, only faced housing discrimination, he faced employment discrimination, he had to work two jobs. By the time he arrived home was eight o'clock at night. I had calmed down about that time. And my father was very quiet, um, very humble person. And so I explained to him what I had learned that day, and he just simply said, it happened a long time ago, and what I did I thought was right, and the government was wrong. It was that clear and simple. And I couldn't ask him any more questions. I saw this hurt go over his face, and it was somebody, it was like somebody you know, socked me in the stomach. And we didn't even talk about it anymore because I knew how hurt he was. And it wasn't a matter of he was ashamed, it was a matter of you know, he didn't think my brother and I would understand um, about that time in history because a lot of Japanese Americans I learned later, you know, they felt at that time of, of, of Executive Order 906X uh, being issued, they had lost their dignity. They had lost their identification. They had lost their country, right? Due process of law was denied. What happened to equal protection under the law? That's what this is about. And that's what we all need to remember. That's what we all need to keep fighting for. And so in 1983, when his case was reopened, that's when I learned he never gave up hope that someday he could reopen his case, but he just didn't know how to do that. Um, he, he knew some attorneys, but it's not like you go up and say, somebody at church, well, by the way, do you want to you know, reopen my Supreme Court case? <laughs> it just doesn't work that way. And besides, attorneys are expensive for you in the room, <laughs> but um, anyway, it, 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 but he, you know, even at the time, his own Japanese American community did not support him. They said, Fred, if you reopen up your case and lose, then we are going to lose our chances for redress and reparations, because that was the movement at the time. 
And part of our education is to also let people know that it was the African Americans civil rights movement of the 60s that inspired Japanese Americans to go for redress and reparations. That's another reason why redress and reparations needs to be a focus in this country for African Americans. But my father didn't listen to anyone. He just, he, 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 st he believed in right and wrong. He believed in his moral principles and he did it with respect. He treated everyone like he wanted to be treated. And so he went on with his Supreme Court case and because he won his decision, it set the precedent for the Civil Liberties Act of 1988 that was signed by President Reagan. So he didn't take no for an answer and truly continued on the rest of his life, crisscrossing this country and telling his story so that other people would learn about the mistakes of the past, but to, to also have them learn that we need to work together to make that difference, that you don't have to go it alone, that you can do this together. And you know that's one reason why he received the Presidential Medal of Freedom in uh, 1998, because of, of all the work that he did. And fortunately, he was living and can continue to be recognized. Unfortunately, Gordon Hirabayashi and Minya Sui, who also continued their work, um, you know, passed away um, when they received the Presidential Medal of Freedom. But they all work together, and this is part of the story. And even Mitsui Endo, who is not really talked about very much, her, her case had to be, was an habeas corpus case. And it's, you know, by the time that the Supreme Court decided that, the, uh, and, and that they were gonna hear this case, which was on the day, the same day as my father's in uh, December 18th, 1944, then the government said, oh, we're gonna close the camps. Well, you know, that became moot, and therefore there was no reason for her to, to con continue on with her case. But even though people in the camps told her, you know, you, you can't do this, you, you, you know, you, you, should, you should stop this, she continued. But she just didn't, couldn't talk about her experience because it was so painful as well. So there are many, many Americans, Asian Americans especially, that have fought for this country and, uh, and my father represents them. You know, he studied in, in every uh, law school in the United States. There's 200 law schools when you study constitutional law. And he gave me the charge to carry on with education five months before he passed away at the age of 86. He kept speaking until that time. And so he gave me that charge to not only tell his story, but to share everybody else's story because that's how we learn from each other. And so we, we are still you know, making some headway. We you know, have eight states, but we need more to make it a national day, which people wanna do, because where is the representation? You know, and that's how we're going to you know, make the difference and to speak up. So the story here and the lesson is, one person can make a difference and so can you. And to remember what my father said, stand up for what is right and don't be afraid to speak up. Thank you. And now I'd, I'd like to um, introduce um, a Lexington High School student, um, Murray uh, 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 Sari Yoshi, and who is going to speak to you now. Good afternoon, everyone. Today I stand before you as a proud Japanese American teen advocating and now celebrating the recognition of Fred Korematsu Day of Civil Liberties and the Constitution. My name is Mirei Saniyoshi, and I'm a Leadership Next Gen Fellow with CARE, which is the Coalition for Anti Racism and Equity. CARE promotes racially inclusive K 12 curriculum and sharpens students' advocacy skills through engagement with community organizations and legislative internships. I'd like to thank the State House, the Fred Korematsu Institute, and the CARE Coalition for the opportunity to speak to you all today. 
1942, tens of thousands of Japanese American children were sent to Japanese internment camps under the pretext of being perceived as a threat to national security. This tragic chapter in history resulted in the wrenching separation of families. And while there, many students underwent Americanization classes to erase their family histories and assimilate into a whitewashed American culture. In 2024, the echoes of Americanization classes persist in Massachusetts' contemporary education system, where rich AAPI narratives are sidelines in textbooks and public discourse. As a 16-year-old student, I have rarely heard my own culture spoken about in the classroom. At best, students hear about what has happened to the Asian American community, and not what Asian Americans have done for this country. Students learn that ja about how Japanese American or Japanese internment happened to Japanese Americans and how they were treated, but not how Japanese Americans fought for their rights and civil liberties. As we move forward, we must decide the legacy that we want to leave for future generations, a legacy of Eurocentric and monolithic Americanization, or one of a vibrant American tapestry with diverse opinions, cultures, and peoples in our history textbooks and everyday lives. At the young age of 23, Fred Korematsu refused to stand for the dehumanizing and unconstitutional ruling that all Japanese people should be relegated to incarceration camps due to the unfounded fear-mongering by the courts. In a world where Asians are still stereotyped and shamed into being quiet and unassuming, as well as AAPI people constantly being seen as permanent foreigners, it's essential to recognize Fred Korematsu's courageous voice. To nurture the next generation of leaders, we must honor the bold civil leaders who came before us and who spoke out when others could not and did not. In a world still grappling with things like xenophobia, discrimination, and societal challenges, neglecting the efforts of courageous individuals is not an option. The figures of our government that they choose to celebrate reflect the values we pass on to the next generation. And amid mass, in mass inequalities of the status quo, we need to inspire the next generation of Fred Korematsu's, young leaders who will fight for justice even when the system is structured to exclude them. This day of recognition is a step in the right direction, in the direction of the true American spirit. Fred Korematsu Day would serve as a rallying point for Asian American representation and advocacy and education. We can work towards an America where AAPI people are seen as Americans rather than permanent foreigners. The sobering reality is that I, as a U.S. citizen born and raised on songs like Party in the USA and speaking less Japanese than my friends who are obsessed with anime and Duolingo, would have been sent to an incarceration camp because I would not be viewed as an American, but rather an enemy to America itself. This day will be a platform for meaningful dialogue on Japanese internment's legacy and its relevance today. Similar to MLK Day, it can inspire discussions, community service, and representation, fostering a commitment to justice and equality for future generations. I urge you all to join me in celebrating the Fred Korematsu Day of Civil Liberties and the Constitution. Let us honor the courage and resilience of Fred Korematsu, and let us reaffirm our commitment to building a society where justice and equality can prevail. Next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Paul Watanabe, an esteemed professor and director of UMass Boston's Institute for Asian American Studies. He'd like to, he'd like to first start by sharing a short video. Thank you. of history is to not repeat mistakes of the past. It's why a UMass Boston professor brings his students to the Japanese internment camp where his family was forced to live for four and a half years. Now, this is an emotionally draining journey into the California desert, where Susan Tran has a story of their recent pilgrimage. It's all new. That's it. Internees could only take what they could carry when they were forced to relocate to these internment camps. Inside Professor Paul Watanabe's UMass Boston classroom, the whole internment experience was a cultural genocide. The small group of juniors have just returned from their visit to Manzanar. There was a list on the executive order of things that people were told to bring. It was like bed sheets, pillowcases, dishes, clothes, and nothing else. Anything that kind of was representative of the culture you had to conceal. <laughs> This was one of 10 internment camps the American government set up to incarcerate 120,000 Japanese Americans during World War II, including Professor Watanabe's family. And every time I go there, I look at the uh, screen that they have there where they have the names of the people that are listed. And I see my, my, my brother and my, my father and my, my mother there. And I feel so bad because I feel like I'm really abandoning them when I leave that place. But I, 
I see the need to come back and, and say, when I leave that place, I'm not going to really leave them there. I'm going to teach people about it. This is the eighth year the poli sci professor has taken his students to this remote part of California. You said this was a laundry facility? Where in 1942, <coughs> 2,000 people of Japanese heritage were given two days to pack up their homes and forced to live in this relocation center. Most were citizens. Some had sons fighting in the war. They just risked their lives on the battlefield, and then they had to go back into like captivity where other people are pointing guns at them for them to say it was for their safety that was the most insulting part of it guard towers and barbed wire surrounded 500 barracks where families got 20 by 25 feet of space there were no walls where they lived no partitions between toilets or showers it reminded me of what i imagine a prison to be like the class of 10 tried to imagine life in these dire conditions extremely hot there was just dust everywhere and my first reaction was, wow, the government must have chosen the worst possible spot to put these people. Another not surprising fact is it was probably on purpose. Along the dirt paths, American history lessons not always found in their childhood classrooms. I knew very little about Japanese internment. Um, growing up in New England, I didn't have a big unit on that in school. These people in history were wronged, and now we have these ways that we can honor them. Manzanar has now become sacred space where every year roughly a thousand people from all around the world make a pilgrimage to the site. You are in the middle of nowhere. It doesn't matter. Like you are always going to be isolated. It's almost like a ghost town. Like you feel the presence of people there. When the war ended in 1945, the government closed Manzanar and the nine other camps, dismantling them and sending thousands of families to try and rebuild their lives. These injustices keep happening and everyone likes to look back and say, like, never forget, I would have been better if I was there. But these injustices are still happening. It's the one critical lesson Professor Watanabe hopes guides his students in the future. Whatever the concern is, I think you got to take this notion that this history is something that you got to preserve, you have to understand it, you have to tell people about it, because it's critical. Susan Tran, NBC10 Boston. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for having a little piece on my class. It's a wonderful experience to be teaching this stuff as I have for now almost 30 years. I'm one of the few people in the university, that, in the university system nationwide, who's ever done a class on the internment of Japanese Americans. And I actually do two classes now. I do one for a general audience as a lecture class on it, and then now I, I do a class that I take here, which is a, a a research seminar where students do work on the internment itself. So that's what you saw there. Now, for me and many people like myself, for 50 years, when the issue came up recently about anti-Asian violence, we were asked to respond. And I gave the same response I've been giving for 50 years. And it's the same response I think I hope I would have given when the United States was created and, and Asian Americans were uniquely set aside as aliens ineligible for citizenship. They were allowed to come here, but not allowed to become citizens. So think about that. And it's the same lecture I would have given when Chinese exclusion came in 1882. For the first time in our nation's history, we told a group of people, you cannot come to the United States because of who you are and where you're coming from. This was the nation that did not have something known as an illegal immigrant before 1882. And it began the process by which people largely became def defined as illegal immigrants after 1882. And it's the same discussion I think I would have had at the beginning of the 19th century when the United States began alien land laws, uh, uh, when we said that Im Asian immigrants could not hold land or could not vote or participate in various activities in the United States. And it's the same discussion that we had in the beginning of the 19th century when we created an immigration system that said, after we excluded Asia, uh, Jap Chinese Americans in 1882, it extended to all Asians in 1924. So I wish I would have been there to give the same argument. And it, it certainly during the period of World War II when there was an incarceration of Japanese Americans, I wish I would have made the same arguments that I will make today and I continue to make today about the need to, for Asian Americans to be considered part of our, cons of our society as not perpetual foreigners, as not 
products of collective guilt or anything like that. That we're tied here to the United States of America and we should be judged for what we do here in America and not what we did, what is done by our, our descendants elsewhere. And I think I would have given the same argument because I was alive now for the latter parts of these things. For the yellow peril of the, after the Chinese victories in, in the, the Chinese national wars in the late 19, uh, 1940s, when the, the victory for China led to all kinds of oppression of Chinese Americans in the United States. And I think I would have given the same arguments as I do now in, in the U.S. imperial wars in Asia resulted in Southeast Asians coming to the United States in large numbers. And I think I would have given the same arguments as, the, as when Vincent Chin was killed in 1983 because of anti-Asian sentiments here in the United States, largely driven against Japanese successes in the economic sphere. And I would have given the same arguments after 9-11 when our Sikh brothers and sisters were attacked for being perpetually foreign and the assumption that they were tied to some respects with those people who, who attacked us and the collective guilt that was attached to this argument and led to the attacks by people who looked like the enemy in this case and were not really the enemy. And I think I would have given the same argument as I have now. After recently, when we have attacks made in places like uh, the, the attacks made in Wisconsin at a Sikh temple, or made in, in uh, Atlanta at the killing of six people in a, in a working in, in spas, or in Monterey Park, California, a large, California uh, community of Chinese Americans. And, these, and the killings continue to some degree. And we see that these arguments are, are ones that accompany the fact that Asian Americans today are considered, considered the greatest threat to them in the United States today is the fear that anti-Asian sentiment will, will attack, that they will be attacked by uh, their fellow Americans for anti-Asian sentiment will be directed at them. This is the case for most Americans. During the period of time when, over, when the, uh, the COVID-19 virus was most felt by most Americans, and most people were asked, what did they consider their greatest threat? Universally, Americans said, of course, getting COVID-19. The one group who said it was not COVID-19 was Asian Americans. They said it was the fear of being victimized by their fellow Americans as anti-Asian. They were the ones who feared that greater than they feared getting COVID-19. And Boston school students who indicated, for example, that they felt most uncomfortable of all students now in being part of schools, that they felt less, less sense of belonging of any students in the Boston City schools during the COVID period of time because they felt that they might be attacked or so forth. In the Taft survey, the, the, the Asian American Foundation did a national survey recently and asked the Americans of all races, what, what do you consider the greatest sense of sense of belonging or sense of feeling completely accepted? And Asian Americans, only 22% of Asian Americans said they felt completely accepted or sense of belonging, the lowest of any racial group in the United States. So the sense in some respects is there as well. And I th again, I think it's part of this notion of perpetual foreignness and the way that they've been treated here in the United States. So there's, the, you know, we think about history in terms of narratives, and the narrative of World War II in some respects was Japanese Americans were badly treated, there li the little they could do, with, do about it, and they, and they stuck it out and they emerged successful. Well, that's a particular narrative, but the narrative that Craig Korematsu reminds us of and other people reminds us of is a different one. It's a narrative that Japanese Americans throughout all this history that I talk about did not simply sit there and put it up, put up with it, that they fought it and they resisted it. You can't think of American history without Thind and Nozawa, for example, taking on these tasks about questioning issues about their citizenship and their ability to be here in the United States, about Korematsu and Hirabayashi and Yasui and Endo, taking on the structure that people said that Shikata Ganai couldn't be helped, that they said to hell with it, we're gonna, it can be helped, and they're gonna take it on and battle it. And you cannot think about this history without thinking about today, commonly people, the people like the, uh, the, uh, the, the Yuri Kochiamas and other people, the Grace Lee Boggs and other people who have fought this notion that Asian Americans are, 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 are simply a model minority and don't have anything to complain about and so forth. And this, in this spirit, this notion of Asian Americans not, no longer being strangers as we were originally portrayed by Ron Takaki, wisely so because we are strangers to the American people. But we're now nails in the sense that I think that we got to be nails and nails stick out. In the Japanese and the traditional sense of nails stick out, they get hammered. 
Well, we're, lots of people have chosen to be nails, and Craig Karamazza chose to be a nail in, that, in World War II, and we got to stand out and be nails. And we're seeing our, ourselves being emerged in various areas, areas in the arts, for example. The head of the Boston uh, Ballet now is a young Asian-American woman. And I find out today just, uh, where is she over here? The head of the new Boston Lyric Opera is now an Asian-American woman who is now today. So we see these breakthroughs, and we see them in politics, obviously, with our own Mayor Wu and other people at the national level, Kamala Harris, the Vice President of the United States, and other areas. We see these breakthroughs. These are people who are resisting the notion that Asian Americans must sit back and accept their fate, that the narrative is that they cannot do anything, that Shikata Ganai must be the way we do it. So for those of us who hit the local level, the people who are fighting for rights of Im immigrants and fighting for housing rights and affordable housing like CPA and people like that and organizations like that, and all you people here are fighting for justice for Asian Americans and the notion that we will no longer be allowed to be kicked around, that we're going to be nails, but we're going to be nails that are going to stand out, we're going to exist, insist that we're a part of this country, that we're not a perpetual foreigner, that we're going to be a part of this country forever. That's why I'm here, and it's a lesson I've given for the last 50 years, and hopefully now with the Korematsu uh, Day proclamation, we can, we can all f rally around it. It's a sense of community that it also will b builds upon, upon us. As I was saying, uh, the Consul General here understands, I was in Washington with Consul Generals from the United States, Japanese, and, and with the Ambassador, and had dinner with the Ambassador, and he asked me to give the final toast, and I felt privileged to do so. And he asked me what, what I thought about the United States experience for Asian Americans, and I thought about my, my grandkids who I took to Japan for the first time this past, uh, this past spring. And I asked my eight-year-old child, I said, what was that experience like? She said to me, it, it represented one thing. I said, what was that? She said, a sense of community. This is an eight-year-old kid. It felt a sense of community being in Japan. And that's what Korematsu does for all of us here. It gives us a sense of community, a sense that we're part of something bigger than ourselves, that Asian Americans who are now the fastest growing group in Massachusetts and the nation, and that we can all look upon each other as friends, as people who belong to a larger community bigger than ourselves. And that's an important thing for all of us that we feel a sense of community that, that the Korematsu thing will do for those of us who are Asian-Americans and Japanese-Americans as well as all of us. We'll get the sense that we belong to something bigger than ourselves, and that's a wonderful thing for us to do, something that will be wonderful to be felt by an 8-year-old kid, and it's wonderful to be felt like a 70-year-old something like I am. So thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you all so much, and, and thank you, Dr. Watanabe, for your words, and, and Dr. Korematsu and, and, and Mayor Wu. Um, it's really just such uh, humbling to be here to hear your words and, and what a uh, multi-generational, multicultural struggle this is. So really, um, just thank you all so much. Um, we're going to close out our, our uh, presentation today um, and really just wanted to um, end with a call to action, right? Because we've heard these beautiful stories and now it's, it's time to act as, as uh, Fred so eloquently uh, said and left with us. Um, so first, uh, I do want to just highlight, uh, please contact your legislators about H3119. We are, we are so happy to have this proclamation. It is truly a historic day uh, for it to come forward, but we want this in perpetuity. That's what this bill would do. I also do want to highlight that uh, 2024 marks the 80th anniversary uh, for the Korematsu versus United States decision. So this is really such a um, fortuitous that this is happening this year and that this proclamation, but we'd like to um, you know, push this legislation forward and please contact your legislators. Then uh, Mireille will have you do the next one. Yeah. Um, we'd also like to call for advancing racially, ethnically, and culturally inclusive curriculum in all Massachusetts schools. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> We also want to highlight um, there's a bill that is filed to advocate and uh, for increased representation of communities of color on public boards and commission. That's something we know our governor has taken many uh, strides towards, but we want to have that codified in law so that regardless of who's in the office, right, that we ensure that the diversity on our public boards and uh, commissions remains. So that's one as well. We'd also like to call for learning more about the history of Japanese internment and AAPI activism. <laughs> <laughs> 
And finally, to, you know, again, to hold to the um, spirit and mission of the Fred T. Korematsu Institute, you know, we are we're committing to fight against injustices of all kinds and participate in civic engagement activities all year round, just as his, uh, this holiday is to commemorate and to encourage us all to do. So with that, thank you all so much for being here. Really appreciate you all. And uh, yeah, thank you.